tell me a little bit about what you've been doing this winter. I know uh, it's been a different winter than what we're used to with the warm weather, but what have you been up to? Yeah, we seem to be in this trend, uh, you know, these milder winters. Uh, we did have a couple of weeks of super harsh, but not enough to put any amount of ice on anything. Um, we're going to have an early spring, no doubt, on the big lake. Uh, but what we do in the wintertime, we, we, we make repairs that need to be done. You know, we did some of those and ready our gear for the season and see old friends that you don't see during the season and yeah. did some visiting down south and, you know, we're just excited to get going. Yeah. So you alluded to a little bit, you know, with the warm weather, probably an early season. Tell me about how you think the season's going to kind of play out for you this year. Definitely going to be an early season. There's no doubt about it. Um we're excited for the, for our salmon crop this year. Mm -hmm. We saw some really, really good fish toward the end of the season last year that weren't going to mature. Mm -hmm. That probably did nothing but grow this year. So uh, I think we're going to see some, some good-sized fish and a good population. Yeah. Talked to a couple other captains uh, while I've been at the show, and the fish that they said that they were catching that were silver in October were really nice fish, and they're, they're really excited for the year, too. Absolutely. So you fish out of Alcott? Alcott Harbor. Yeah, tell our, our audience a little bit about that. So Alcott Harbor is 18 miles, 18 statute miles from the Niagara River, and uh, very consistent fishing. We have uh, we have the flow out front. You know, we have the Niagara flow, and we we get to get into that. You know, some days we got to run west, some days we got it right out front, and it's very consistent fishing. And you know, we got a very good varied uh, fishery to attack. You know, we got all the species available at different times of the year. And, you know, it's a really great place to call home. So what is that? See, usually that, that May is kind of the time when things really start to heat up in your area. What is that like, people fishing that neck of the woods that time of year, that, that early May into June? So last year, we, we, had, we really had uh, it heating up by the third week in April. And when I say that, that is the warmer water affecting, you know, the Pacific salmon fishery. Uh, but we were able to catch, you know, trophy trout right out of the gate. You know, we're, we can get out of the end of March. We've got uh, big browns, big, big lake trout. Mm -hmm. And then we just uh, work that shallow water until the water starts warming up deeper. And then uh, we got salmon to fill for. And uh, so we're expecting that to happen, you know, in the end of April. Yeah. So what kind of temperatures... Is that lake water running, and, and where does it need to go for when you go, all right, it's starting to get get going? seems to be we want at least 40, 41 degrees mm -hmm. to start seeing the Pacific salmon reliably um, under that, and uh, I don't think they trust it enough. Um, they, they live in the depths where that 39-degree water has sunk to the bottom. But once that bait fish movement starts, we get some of the ones uh, testing the waters, and we start hitting them on our our brown trout gear, which is pretty exciting, because they'll be right in 10 foot of water. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times when, when that happens more than once, we know to start looking out on the outside mm -hmm. for a bigger group of fish. So that's got to be crazy. You're out there looking for browns, and, and all of a sudden you're popping kings off. What is What does kind of that transition look like then when you start going from browns into king mode? So typically what we would do there is we might hit, we might work real shallow water um, and make sure we get in on some of those big brownies because a lot of those people that come that time of year, they're hoping to at least see some of those fish. Mm -hmm. And that isn't always the best place to encounter the salmon. So we might start, you know, in real shallow water and then work it out as the day progresses. And once we consistently, you know, find those Pacific salmon, kings and cohos, you know, we're going to, we're going to start the day out there. Yeah. Start moving out a little bit deeper. And, and how do you deploy your, your lines once things get going there, like in May and you start seeing that influx of salmon come in, what does that spread look like? So, you know, we run a lot of body baits in, when we're in real shallow water and, and even, even for salmon, we run body baits, but once you start getting out in the 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 foot of water, uh, we'll go to a lot more spoons, mm -hmm. and you know, typically they're medium to large size spoons. That's the first bait fish that's usually coming into the shallow water, adult bait fish. Mm -hmm. And um, every year is different, but last year it was it was pretty consistent towards the uh, third week in April. Yeah, 
and and that neck of the woods, it really is a mixed bag fishery too. Right. That's what's exciting is like you don't know what's going to be at the end of the line there. No, you really don't. Um, like I said, we we might be thinking we're last year our first adult king I think came in eight or ten foot of water on a on a medium light rod, seven and a half footer, small reel, fishing brown trout in there, and uh, we had a we had a young guy on the rod and with a little help from his father you know he got him in and it was super exciting um but uh we transitioned into spoons and we started fishing that that water where when it starts warming up you get that you get that 50 foot of water 60 foot of water where it starts hitting 40 41 you're going to see a lot more of those specific salmon there in some years it is it is further west towards the niagara or some years it's it's our way and even east if that's blowing cold water. We don't expect that this year. We expect that to be warming up rapidly. Yeah. But that time of year, like in May, you're seeing kings, you're seeing cohos, and, and I mean, you're catching steelhead too. It's just, it's a complete mixed bag out in that water. Complete mixed bag. And you'll, you'll get a few fresh, fresh steelies in there, but usually you encounter those when you start fishing deeper water. There's sight feeder, the high in the column. What we run into in the shallow water is, uh, you know, the drop backs that are coming out of the tributaries. Mm -hmm. But you, you really don't know what's on there. And we usually get at least one or two giant smallmouth. Mm -hmm. You know, they're in there getting ready to pre-spawn, and uh, we run into those too. Yeah, that's pretty cool. The DEC's got one over there, a mountain. I think it's like an eight-pounder. And, I mean, that's got to be a lot of fun. No, it is a lot of fun. You know, we don't have a, an open season on Ontario that early, but I'll tell you what, that lake can grow. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It it, it wouldn't be far-fetched to have a world record come out of there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that, you know, I, I haven't fished with you out of your port, but I've been real close. I fished out of Wilson, and you got some some major currents there. I mean, it's, it's oh, a, yeah. if, if you want to see what currents are like, that's the place to go. Tell us about some of the challenges that you can face in that fishery with, with all the different currents. Well, you know, you got the main Niagara flow there, and day to day, it shifts in and out. And with that amount of water moving from, you know, west to east, you're always going to have some back eddies, too. It's got to counter that movement. So you're going to have back eddies, and, you know, that can create a highway for the fish, obviously. We can find the tent breaks. We got the fish hawk probe down there all the time, monitoring our speed. But a lot of times, it's 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 reading that temp change there on that on that edge. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, they're an edge they're an edge creature just like so many others, and they'll run that like a like a fence line. So Vince, we've been talking early season. What is it? What is it like on a Olcott as the season progresses? We get into summer. So our area can shine in that late spring period, early summer. We got a lot of stability. We've got warm enough water without it being too warm. We have rapid, rapid depth change there, and you know it can be it can be extremely good. Fish are still heavily on the feed before they start migrating their respective areas in the lake, and uh, it's heavy on Pacific salmon. Sometimes we get a really scalding hot coho bite there. And then, uh, you know, we're starting to see more and more steelhead. As we're moving out a little bit, fishing the top 20, you'll run into steelhead. And um, it's just a, it's an excellent fishery. What's what's your favorite way to catch these fish? Are you, uh, you like them popping off on the downriggers? You like them popping off on the divers? Are you one of these guys that like to run the 500 copper and let those guys really feel it for a while? Well, they're all tools. Yeah. Um, probably the rigger. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's a lot closer. Definitely like catching them off the riggers. All right. And, and what kind of leaders do you typically run in your rigger lines? Length? Yeah. Yeah, well, that changes, obviously, in the depth that they're in. You know, it's not uncommon to stretch them back, you know, 60 feet. If you're high in the column uh, and you're in, uh, you know, calm, clear water. But if you're fishing deep, we like to keep them tighter. A lot of times they're, they're attracted to the commotion of the set. And if you drop them back, you're just you're taking it away from them. But if you keep it in a cluster like what's going on around you, um, that often is the approach. And when I say cluster, it could be anywhere 10 foot, 20 foot, 30 foot. Mm -hmm. And um, day to day, wave action, pressure, boat pressure is a big deal. 
uh, and watercolor will vary where we run the leads. So let's talk about that for a minute, boat pressure. When when you're out there on a weekend and there's a lot of boats, are you fishing in that kind of combat area or are you looking for greener pastures away from the crowds? It's tough. It's tough because, you know, for years and years and years, you know, the, the businesses that support us on the shoreline will often say to the new people, well, let's look for the charter boats. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're not that experienced with salmon, so they'll, they'll tail you a little too close. But I, I typically don't like traffic. I like to get away from it. Um, but there's times when you got to deal with it because, you know, that's where the bite is. Right. It's kind of a tough spot because, they, like you say, sometimes there's a reason those boats are there. But at the well, same time, it just makes it more difficult to get around. And, they, you know, and then sometimes you just get all that pressure and they skedaddle out of there. So. We got a question here coming in on YouTube from the Mosquito. It's Captain Vince question about the state of the steelhead fishery. You feel the numbers or the size up or down from 10 years ago? Well, we're probably still coming back from, uh, from an issue that they discovered. Uh, it's really unclear whether it was something that went on in the hatchery or whether it was diet related, but we're absolutely coming back. I have seen it improve last year over a few years prior to that, uh, but I, I do recognize uh, that downturn that you did. Um, so I'd say right now it's improving, and we're just watching them closer. A lot more pen projects for steelhead now, which anytime you can pen the stocked fish, it's beneficial. The, the uh, habitat for the warm water species is nothing but improved all over the Great Lakes. So you've got fish predators for these young steelhead, young salmon. And then of course, we're all battling the bird problem. You know, cormorants are a real nemesis that we have to address. But uh, I think it's back on the upswing. Yeah, that's something that's near and dear to your heart. I've seen you pulling pens around with your, with your smaller boat. Can right. you talk a little bit about that, that pen program and why it's important? Pen projects, absolutely vital. I mean, there's money going into it, and it just doesn't make sense to put all that effort, whether it be in the hatchery or whether it be the volunteers that help with the pen projects. It doesn't make any sense to put all that effort into it and then have the birds gobble them up and we'll release them. Mm-hmm. Salmon are challenging because when they get released from the pens, there's a time when they're going to start smolting. We have to release them from the pens. It's a combination of their their aging into smolting period where they imprint in the river and also water temperature. That speeds up that 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 smolting process and then they they move out into the big lake. Mm-hmm. But that can happen <clears throat> that can happen over the course of days. So even though, you know, there's a lot of hazing effort going on with birds it can be three days later and they're still picking off those those stock uh, baby salmon because they're jumping around where they're gonna imprint to. And of course, we want them to come back to each respective harbor where they're planted. So it's an ongoing battle with that, but there's a lot of uh, lot of effort that goes into our pen projects. Um, and, and you know, I'm one of the volunteers there in Alcott and um, the LATSA organization helps us tremendously in Alcott. So uh, there's about 10, 10 locations where they're being penned on the South Shore. All right, I got a question from Jim Lemon. Jim, you're going to want to definitely come tomorrow to our show. Uh, he wants to know what's going on with the lamprey eels in your neck of the woods. Okay, so that brought up, we went many years where you no know, rock fishermen didn't bring up lampreys. Guys that are out there every day would encounter them, but it wasn't very common. Mm-hmm. So what happened was, during the COVID years, the federal government of the of, uh, United States, the federal government of Canada, did not allow their, their cormorant, their, uh, I'm sorry, their lamprey treatments to take place. They weren't allowed to travel. So a lot of streams went untreated, and that created a boom of lamprey. And so we are seeing improvement as of last year. I expect it to be improved again this year. But that's why we did see that big upswing in Lampreff. Yeah, we're going to have a person tomorrow, Jim, at noon, coming in from uh, the Great Lakes 
uh, initiative. They're going to come in and, and talk to us tomorrow at noon to uh, talk lamprey. So if you're interested in that topic, make sure you join us tomorrow at noon Eastern. We'll be talking about that. Let's do one more question. I want to bring in Shane Rubianos. He's hanging out in the green room right now. Uh, did, this, did the DEC captain scale sample fin sample genetic study regarding percentage of wild salmon are in Lake Ontario? Do you understand that question? I understand okay. the question. Go ahead. So I spoke to the gentleman with the DEC just a few hours ago, and they still have to secure the contracts for that genetic testing. We did do the collections. There was a, a, a bunch of volunteers from east to west that took place, took the sampling, and we provided all that to the DEC. And that is still early in the in the testing stages. But once they get it rolling, I think you know we'll we'll get that data. 